analysis. And so let's stop and discuss what, what is surface analysis. So let's say we have a, a technique that has a depth resolution of 1,000 nanometers or more. And uh, with this, we can get an understanding of maybe the overall composition of our material. But let's say we look a little bit more shallow. So with a depth resolution on the order of 100 nanometers, we can begin to see that our material is made up of, of a layer of possibly different compositions of materials. And looking a little bit more closely, once we go down to the uh, less than 10 nanometer range, we can begin to see that our material is made up of layers of different atoms and molecules. And this is what we uh, call surface analysis. It's the uh, study of the outermost layers of materials, usually on the order of 5 to 10 nanometers. OK, with uh, surface analysis, we'll have a primary beam that we'll use to excite the sample. And these can be any one of the three fundamental particles, ions, electrons, and photons. Each of these particles can then excite any one of the other three, ions, electrons, and photons. Generally, the surface analysis techniques are confined to ions and electrons, as the uh, mean free paths of photons through solids are, are larger than what we would consider to be uh, surface analysis. So of the techniques you'll learn about during this uh, workshop uh, of the surface analysis techniques, uh, we'll have XPS, AES, and tomorrow Dr. Spiela will discuss secondary ion mass spectrometry. And so in terms of spot sizes, uh, we'll span for XPS orders of millimeters to micron length scales. OGA will go down to uh, sub-micron, okay? XPS and OGA will have about tenths of atomic percent sensitivities, roughly. Uh, the SIM systems are generally right in between XPS and OGA in terms of uh, analysis areas. But as you can see here, are, they're far more sensitive, down to the uh, part per billion. And so uh, we'll be focusing in this regime right here. OK, so uh, we'll start with uh, photoelectron spectroscopy. That is, we'll have photons in and electrons out. Now, the photoelectron spectroscopy is XPS. They're based on the photoelectric effect, as you might assume. Discovered in the uh, late 1800s by Hertz. And then it was later described in quantum mechanical terms by Albert Einstein, from which he received the Nobel Prize. And then it wasn't until the mid-1960s that a professor in Sweden developed this as a practical analytical tool. It took that long for the uh, vacuum technology to progress so that we could actually apply some of the things that they discovered earlier to actual materials. So this is a schematic of the experiment we'll be doing as the way we'll have the instruments in this university configured. We'll have a, a large stationary X-ray beam that we'll use to excite the sample. Usually we'll use light elements. And so uh, those x-rays will penetrate you know, a, a micron or so. They're usually over an area of 10 millimeters to about 2 millimeter in area. Then from that, we'll extract a small area of electrons. And then we'll use that to generate our signal. As I mentioned, uh, XPS is based on the photoelectric effect. And in that process, an incident X-ray is directed towards a material. That X-ray is fully absorbed. And then with that energy that is used to excite a uh, either core level or valence level electrons. OK, so this electron will eject with the amount of kinetic energy that's equal to how much energy we put into the system minus how tightly it's held. OK, so an XPS will generally not plot the data on a binding on a kinetic energy scale, we'll transform this equation and plot it on a binding energy scale instead of the kinetic energy scale. Following the uh, excitation of the photoelectron, we'll be left with an ion that's in an excited state. Now, this ion will relax in one of two ways. The first way is by having the upper shell electron fill that hole and having a third electron ejected. This is an OJ electron, OK? So we'll be able to see OG electrons in our photoelectron spectra. Now, with the OG electrons, uh, the kinetic energy of this emitted electron is equal to how much energy was conserved in this relaxation. So its kinetic energy is actually independent 
of the X-ray source energy. The other way this atom can relax, or ion can relax and lose its energy, is by the emission of an X-ray photon. Now this would be the basis of X-ray fluorescence, which I'll not, not be talking about today. Okay, so let's say we have a sample. Our sample's a city made up of different buildings. Buildings are our atoms. Okay, so now being good electron spectroscopists, we're not going to look at the city this way. We're going to look at it this way. And by doing so, we're able to define an energy scale that's common to all our atoms in our material. Okay, we'll define that energy level as the Fermi level. So the binding energies that we'll be interested in for XPS, the definition of a binding energy, is actually the difference between the core level energy and the Fermi level. Okay, the ocean energies that we'll be looking at are actually basically the difference between the different levels in the atom. So how deep you can, you'll know that your atom, your materials could be made of, at, of atoms of different atomic number and basically how deep we can probe depends upon how much energy we have available to us. With XPS we'll be using soft x-rays, either aluminum or magnesium. So in all atoms we can't probe all the elements in all of the atoms. Just in the, we can probe all of the atoms all of the orbitals in just the lightest of the atoms. So for the first row, we'll be looking at s orbitals. And just as a comparison, if we were to look at an s electron in gold, its binding energy as compared to carbon would be 81,000 eV, which we don't have the energy to eject that. But that doesn't matter. There's some other electrons that are available to uh, us to probe. And then I will be, so for XPS, Predominantly, we'll be using soft x-rays. I uh, will be briefly discussing a little bit of UPS. UPS is known as ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy. And with that, we'll be using an ultraviolet photon. And with that, we have much less energy, just enough energy to probe the valence levels. Okay, The energy of the sources we have are uh, helium, helium-1 and helium-2 lines, so 22 and 40.8 eV. Okay, so what makes the uh, photoelectron spectroscopy so surface sensitive? That's the fact that electrons at these energies cannot travel very far through a solid before they're scattered and lose their characteristic energies. Now, the parameter that we use to describe the distance an electron can travel through the solid is known as the inelastic mean free path. And that is the average diff distance the electron travels between inelastic scattering events. And so these numbers can be calculated by models. And you'll see, for the most part, uh, the meat free paths tend to increase with uh, kinetic energies of the electrons being ejected. Okay, They do also, for the most part, tend to decrease with increasing z, but not completely. If you'll notice right here, the copper and the silver electron meat free paths are almost the same, but their atomic numbers are quite different. So the main parameter that influences this value is its electron density. So for XPS, we'll be looking in the range of uh, about 20 to uh, 1400 eV. So we'll be probing about these distances, anywhere from 0.5 nanometers down to up to about 2.5 nanometers. O'Shea, because we can look at some higher energy lines, we can probe a little bit deeper. So now, if we uh, assume inelastic scattering only, we can actually determine how deep we look with the XPS. If we use the Beer-Lambert relationship, we can see that intensity of the electrons decay exponentially as a fun function of depth. Okay. So uh, if we assume an elastic mean free path of about 1.6 nanometers, uh, we'll, re we'll reach 5% of the signal at 3 lambda. So 3 lambda we call the 95% depth, and that's usually what we'll call our escape depth, or our sampling depth for XPS. It's an exponential decay, so we can actually, in theory, probe to infinity, but the signal will be infinitesimally small. So with a mean-free path of 1.6 eV, our 3 lambda signal is about 
five nanometers. So we'll be looking at usually five nanometers or less of material. Okay, so let's stop and discuss some of the principal advantages and disadvantages of surface analysis. So the main advantage is the techniques are extremely surface sensitive. And so the main disadvantage of the technique is it's extremely surface sensitive. So sometimes XPS and OJ is a little bit too surface sensitive. And so what we see may end up not being what we're really interested in looking at. We may be looking at mostly some surface oxidation or surface contamination. And so what we do in some cases is we'll attach an ion source to our system that we can jet, we could direct an energetic ion beam towards the material. And usually we're operating in the range of 0.5 to 5 keV, and that's known as the linear cascade regime. And so that ion beam will travel through the solid in a series of binary collisions, and then transfer momentum into the material that will eventually be redirected to the surface, and then knock out a surface atom. Okay? So we'll use that to remove material from the surface and actually probe a little bit more deeply. This technique, as you can see, though, is a, it's a fairly physical process, and so it can actually produce a fair amount of damage to your material, and also, as you'll see a little bit later, can alter the composition in some binary compounds. Okay, so this is a basic schematic of an XPS system. We'll have an X-ray source, then the series of lenses. Okay, Our first set of lenses right here will project an image, a photoelectron image of the sample to a plane right here we'll call a selected area aperture plane. And so we'll make that electron image pass through a, a, a variety of different sized apertures. And that's how we'll define the analysis area. Okay? Our X-ray spot is fixed in diameter. And so we'll vary the aperture here, and that's how we'll change the analysis area. These next set of lenses right here will project the image to an entrance aperture of the analyzer. So when we're in spectroscopy mode, we'll close this down to a slit. And so the second lens basically acts as a transform. So we'll transfer a two-dimensional spatial image to the detector and that will become an energy dispersed image or a spectrum. I might also point out that the other thing that the XPS systems do in these extraction lenses, they'll also, they'll also apply a retarding field. So what we'll do is we'll slow the electrons down to a common energy known as a pass energy. You'll hear some people refer to pass energies in XPS. Okay? That is the energy the electrons are slowed down to as they pass through the analyzer. Then the analyzer acts like a bad pass filter. We'll hold that pass energy constant, and in doing so, we can have an energy resolution that is constant over a wide spectrum of binding energies. And that's quite helpful for us, as you'll see later, in terms of uh, being able to identify uh, chemical states. Here's a picture of uh, our, one of our two systems in the facility. Okay. So here you can see this is the X-ray source. Okay. There's the en energy analyzer, the hemisphere in the back. Our sample would sit right inside there. We'd load it through a load lock right there. Okay, so let's discuss the first thing you could do with XPS, and that is to um, identify elements. So as I mentioned, we'll be scanning our analyzers and using that to identify the elements of, and also chemical states that are present in our material. So what arises, how do the binding energies come about? Well, the electron can have repulsions from other electrons and also an attraction to the nucleus. And so what we'd be interested in in the XPS is we're looking at the binding energy, and that means how tightly the electrons are bound to the nucleus. And in general, along a certain set of orbitals, the binding energies will increase. And they'll increase with functions similar to this. So you'll see for the lighter elements, we'll look at some of the deeper orbitals, the 1s. And so you'll see that uh, we don't have to go very far up an atomic number before we get 
to a point where we don't have enough X-ray energy to excite those. But that's okay, we'll then move to another orbital. And eventually for the heavier elements, we'll start looking at the most outermost orbitals. So here's an example showing uh, the binding energies of the 2P and 3P lines of uh, the first row transition metals. You can, you can see that the 2Ps, they increase quite dramatically in energy, whereas the 3Ps do not as much. But if we look at the separation between the two, you can see that not only the binding energies are increasing, but the separations in the orbitals increase. And that is what allows us to actually do OJ spectroscopy. That, that's why we can produce a signal that's characteristic of the elements by looking at the differences in the orbitals, not just the orbital energies themselves. Here's an example of a series of first row transition metal nitrides that were grown in situ here. And we can see as we move from scandium up to chromium, the metal lines move up in binding energy. Okay. You'll also note that the Auger lines right here, they're actually moving down in binding energy. Okay. That is because of the way that we're plotting these spectra. So if you remember from my first slide, the kinetic energies of the OJ lines are independent of the photon source. Uh, so usually, so I, sh I should say the kinetic energies of the photoelectron lines are dependent on the photon source, so we'll plot those on a binding energy scale. But because the kinetic energies of the OJ lines are not dependent, once we plot them on a uh, uh, binding energy scale, they become dependent. And then the binding energy scale is also reciprocal of the kinetic energy scale. So as the kinetic energies of the OJ line increases, your parent binding energies decrease. Okay, you'll, you'll notice that uh, nitrogen is a common element between these nitrides. And on this scale, these lines do not appear to move. You'll see a little bit later that they do, in fact. Okay, so that's not the only thing we can do with XPS. XPS, we can also look at uh, changes in chemical state. So let's say we'll attach an oxygen atom to carbon. Oxygen is a little bit more electronegative than carbon, so it's going to pull electron density away from the carbon at the valence level. Okay. That'll cause a loss of electronic screening of the carbon nucleus, and that those electrons will be pulled a little bit more tightly. And so what we'll see once we bound, bind an oxygen to carbon is we should see a shift to slightly higher binding energies, and which is what we do. So here's uh, a table that shows carbon bonded to a group of different a set of different functional groups, and we see we can get uh, when we bond a nitrogen to a carbon, we'll get a shift of about an EV. Uh, oxygen, an EV and a half, which is about the same as chlorine. And then it turns out that if you look at a carbon single bond and a carbon oxygen bond, the carbon oxygen double bond is actually twice of a single bond. So it's like having two oxygen bonds. So you can see we can, uh, for some of the elements, we can get quite a big shift in bonding energy that's sufficient for us to actually distinguish that from the elemental state. So here's an example of XPS of uh, polymethylmethacrylate. And you can see at the survey resolution, uh, the lines look fairly sharp and look like of a single state. But if we look at a higher resolution, we'll notice that we're actually splitting the oxygen into two different states that are related to the two different chemical environments of that oxygen. The carbon is actually split into four different states. We can see the hydrocarbon backbone, the methyl groups, and they pretty much uh, almost nearly overlap. Uh, we'll get some separation with the, the methyl group bonded to the single upper oxygen. We get the biggest separation with the carbon that's bonded to the, to the, uh, the double bond and the single bond oxygen right here. Okay, so with XPS though, what we're actually seeing, I was able to identify this as polymethacrylate, 
because I knew what I was looking at. What we actually see with XPS are actually fragments of the molecule. So the XPS core level binding energies are only sensitive really to the neighboring atoms. So you could probably look maybe one or two atoms away. And so uh, the XPS sensitivity to chemical structures is, rarely, is fairly short range. So additional information, such as knowledge of the sample, or actually the use of complementary methods, which we have available here at uh, the facility, is, ex is pretty essential in terms of uh, thoroughly identifying your uh, sample. Okay, here's another example of uh, the use of XPS to study electronic structure. So XPS is a pretty good method for studying electronic structures because we're looking at the electrons. Okay, so here's an example of our first row transition metals, metal nitrides, once again grown in situ. That, if you remember from the survey, all the nitrogen lines look like they lined up perfectly, but in reality, they do shift a little bit. So, in this experiment, by going up in number of the uh, transition metal, we're actually adding some antibonding electrons, and that actually affects the electronic structure of our nitride. So you'll see that the scanium nitride has the lowest binding energy. That indicates that it has the most ionic bonding. So uh, we're seeing some charge separation. That gives evidence that there is a band gap in this material. And with this data and some other data, we're able to demonstrate that scanium nitride is a wide band gap semiconductor. Then you'll note that uh, the titanium nitride actually has the highest binding energy. So that indicates that this nitride has the highest degree of covalent bonding. Then the other nitrides, as you would expect as we add in the antibonding electrons, they fall in between. So the tendency is now going to lower binding energies, which is also suggesting that the introduction of charge separation or the development of another band gap as we go heavier. Here's one of the two examples of uh, UPS I will, I will give. Uh, the one really good thing about UPS is by using a UV light as our source, we're very sensitive to the valence electrons. Okay, And there's a lot of good electronic structure information in the valence band. Unfortunately, the valence band electrons involved hybrid molecular orbitals, which whose energies change with uh, chemistry and also symmetry. And so often the structures that you'll see are quite complex. And usually you'll have to compare these spectra with some sort of theoretical calculations. So we see here that uh, the scanium nitride, if you look real close, it has a diminishing density of states in the Fermi energy, suggesting it's being a semiconductor. Then we have a Fermi edge developing in the titanium and vanadium. And then here in the chromium, it starts diminishing again, indicating that, that this material is turning semiconducting. OK, so one of the things we'd like to be able to do with the signal that we receive in our spectrometers is to relate that signal somehow to the amount of a certain species present in it. OK? so. Well, let's say we have our detector signal A, which is a count rate. Okay, We can derive equations that uh, will describe where that signal comes from. And we'll have terms in this equation that relate to the number of electrons that are emitted per unit volume and others that describe the volume of our analysis. And then some of these terms will be sample dependent, such as the number of atoms, which is what we'll try to uh, extract from this exercise. And then we'll also have some instrument dependent terms, x-ray flux, analyzer transmission, area, and emission angle. So if we assume the concentration that we're going to be calculating to be a relative ratio of atoms, we can actually neglect many of the instrumentally dependent terms. And that makes the equation much simpler. So what we're left with is uh, cross-section and a transmission function and a mean-free path. Now, generally, 
because of uh, difficulties involved in calculating the inelastic mean free pass, we generally neglect that. Um, as you saw in my earlier slide, we can calculate those numbers for pure materials, but often what we're looking at is an unknown material. That makes it a little bit diff more difficult to calculate the mean free path. So usually we'll neglect that. And um, now modern acquisition and analysis software systems can now account for the transmission function. So that leaves us with uh, our number of atoms being related to uh, the signal divided by what we call a sensitivity factor. And these can be determined either theoretically or empirically with, with standards. Okay, so XPS is generally considered to be a semi-quantitative technique for one of two reasons, because this method assumes that your material is a homogeneous mixture of atoms, which it usually never is. It's always a layered system. And also that because we're neglecting uh, the inelastic mean free path, we're assuming that the analysis volume for all the elements, elemental lines that we're looking at will be the same, but usually they, they never are because the lines are at different kinetic energy. So each element we're sampling a different depth. So for those reasons, uh, we'll consider XPS semi-quantitative, but with a little bit more work and standards, it can be made quite quantitative. Okay, this is just a uh, plot of the relative sensitivities as a function of atomic number. You can see though, this, so in an XPS experiment, remember we're keeping the X-ray source energy fixed, okay? So we can see here that we're getting an increase in sensitivities of each of these orbitals until we reach some peak. And so what the sensitivity is related to, and that, that is, it's the degree of overlap between the initial state wave function, which is the bound electron, and the final state wave function, which is the free electron. So as we go up in atomic numbers, our binding energies increase, which is going to change the kinetic energy of the exiting photoelectron, assuming, the, of course, that the photon energy is constant. And so in doing so, we'll get to a point where we'll reach an optimum. And then eventually, as you would assume, it would drop off as we go beyond that optimum. So you'll, you can see that we can get quite sensitive to f orbital or d orbitals, and f orbitals are increasing right here, but you'll notice uh, I don't reach a peak yet. And that's because if we don't really have an atom that's heavy enough yet that I can look at, that I can get to the peak. But if, if you kind of follow this trend, if you go way out here probably, you'll probably get a peak way up there in f orbitals, we'll, and we'll be very, very sensitive to that element. But that would probably be a pretty nasty element that you wouldn't want to analyze anyway. So Then you'll notice something strange here about the four Ds. Okay, these uh, elements down in here are elements that are right next to the elements that have valence electrons in the 4F. And they produce a fairly complicated electronic structure which plays with the line shape of these lines. And so these ones right now at the moment are not very well understood, but we're constantly working on developing better uh, standard materials where we can actually get some more information about the sensitivities of these elements. Here's an example of the quantitative analysis of our first row transition metal nitrides. And these numbers are being compared with bulk values as determined by Rutherford backscattering, which we'll see tomorrow. And the as deposited surfaces you'll see are very close to stoichiometric with, with the expect, exception of the chromium nitride. So as deposited. And then after ion bombardment, you'll see that we significantly altered the amount of nitrogen as compared to the metal. And this is an example of the uh, damage caused by, caused by the ion sputtering process. Nitrogen being the lighter element, it was pre preferentially removed from the nitride and then uh, alters the stoichiometry. It also alters the electronic structure. So if you're interested in, in the electronic structures of these materials, uh, ion bombardment would not be a good thing to do which is why uh, these nitrides, we actually took the effort to grow them in situ. Okay, so 
If you have optics in your analyzer that can allow you to do so, what you would do now is you can change the angle of your sample and then provided you can collect a narrow enough solid angle of electron emission, you can actually now vary the sampling depth of your material. And you can do an experiment that is known as angle resolved XPS. Let's say we have a uh, film A on B. As we increase our emission angle, we should see an increase of the signal of A with respect to B and become more then more sensitive to the A signal. If we had an alloy that is a uniform homogeneous mixture, we would expect no change. Okay, here's an example of angle resolved XPS of silicon with a thin native oxide. You can see at the uh, zero degree emission, we're more bulk sensitive, so we can see a little bit of the oxide and mostly the non-oxidized silicon. As we go to the uh, higher emission angles, we can see we can accentuate the oxide signal. And just with this simple experiment, we could tell that the oxide is on top of the silicon, but if you're a chemist, you'd think, well, that's obvious, it should be on top. But this is how you would confirm with some unknown system that he had a multiple number of elements, which elements are actually on top. So here's an example of a system that Julio showed this morning. It's that now we can use uh, this angle resolved method with a model and develop a method to determine the thickness of this material. And so we'll be using, again, the Beer-Lambert relationship. Now you have to remember, this is just a model because uh, this is only assuming inelastic scattering. There's also forward scattering that can take place in the emission process. But those models are much more complicated and don't give you that much more in terms of quality of your the number you calculate. So you do it the simple way, it's a little bit easier. And so with this model, we're able to determine that uh, the thickness of the oxide was about an a little bit more than a nanometer with a little bit of carbon on top. So Julio's number was about two, mine's a little bit less, but there are some difficulties with each system. This one, uh, I could be uh, my limited by my determination of the mean free path and the fact that I'm only assuming one type of scattering. There could be some complications in the lipsometry model due to the fact that that measurement is done in air, and there could be a little bit of hydration, which might alter the index of refraction right at the surface, and that could cause maybe a little bit of error. But basically, it shows that we could do, uh, basically get information that is similar with two different techniques. Okay, so now let's move into some more complex experiments that we could do at the XPS. So now, we're going to try to combine spectroscopy with imaging. And with uh, the other instrument we have in the facility, the Kratos Ultra, this system has a hybrid energy analyzer. It's actually two analyzers in one. So in the bottom figure, we actually have the conventional analyzer for spectroscopy that I presented earlier. And the top part is actually our imaging analyzer. So in this experiment, uh, we'll once again project three images, okay, the selected area aperture plane, and then the entrance aperture and the detection plane. But in this case now with imaging, we'll open up the entrance aperture of the analyzer. And then the top analyzer then will act like a mirror and just, just project a two-dimensional <coughs> photoelectron image to the detection plane. So the nice advantage of this configuration of instrument is that both detectors are in the same plane, and they're both in an imaging plane, and it's a real imaging plane. So what we could do then is we can go back and forth between spectroscopy and imaging, collect different areas of our sample without having to move the sample around. And we could do that by the use of some steering plates right here. So basically we're scanning where we're collecting the image. So once again, uh, in this example, our x-ray source is stationary, and it's the electrons that we'll be scanning to produce the image. Okay, so here's an example of 
of the combination of imaging and spectroscopy. Uh, here's an experiment where, uh, with microcontact printing where this group was trying to produce uh, pattern porous pixel, porous silicon pixel arrays, and they would etch the silicon with a platinum catalyst that was selectively deposited inside little areas right here. And so the group wanted to confirm whether or not they were successfully depositing their catalyst. And so this is a uh, overlaid image of carbon in blue and uh, platinum in orange. And uh, showing that, yes, indeed, the platinum is in the dots. And then we can jump into the imaging, or jump from spectroscopy to the imaging, or from imaging to the spectroscopy mode, sorry, and look inside one of the dots and confirm that we actually have platinum in the dot, and then do some high resolution scans and actually try to identify that it is platinum in a metallic state. And then going off the dot, we can confirm that we have much less platinum. We're getting a little bit because I'm probably picking up the edge of the dots, or there could be um, a little bit of platinum deposited everywhere. But the majority of the platinum is inside uh, the dot. And you'll notice that this uh, length scale is fairly, fairly large, um, so it's not too impressive as compared to what you could do with imaging in an XPS. But you have to keep in mind, though, the pl platinum particles I'm looking at are nanoparticles, so they're less than five nanometers in um, size. And so these may be a little bit difficult to see with EDS, but it's heavy enough that you possibly could. Okay, so here's an example now where we're going to combine data collection with ion sputtering. Okay, so here a group is producing uh, photovoltaics and depositing uh, morphous silicon carbide on a tin oxide transparent conducting oxide. And so they're interested in the nature of this interface. Okay, they want to see if there's any uh, reaction that takes place between the deposition process that you're depositing and the tin oxide. And so what they're interested in, in seeing is whether or not this process is reducing the tin oxide to tin metal at the interface. What that would do is that would alter the electronic and optical properties, rendering the interface to no longer be transparent and then reducing its energy efficiency or its, its yield. And if you remember earlier, uh, we're going to try to do sputtering with this. And if you remember earlier, uh, the ion sputtering process is quite damaging and physical and can also alter the chemistry of uh, your material. So it just turns out that if you sputter tin oxide, you will preferentially remove oxygen from it, but you cannot reduce the oxide all the way down to tin metal. So it will reduce from SNO2 to SNO. And so then if we do see tin present at the interface, it was actually caused by the deposition process and not the reaction. So as you can see, as we go into the material, we do in fact see a little bit of tin present right at the interface, which is right about here. And then to confirm the fact that we're not damaging the tin or reducing or producing the tin by the sputtering process, we'll go further into the tin oxide and see that it actually disappears. So we did get a little bit of uh, tin production at the interface through the deposition process. Here's another example of sputtering. And looking closely at the titanium nitrate 2P spectra, we'll see that we have these real nice satellites that are related to uh, final state effects. They're actually removed during the sputtering process. So the final state effect is related to the electronic structure of the titanium nitride. As you can see, by the sputtering process, we did alter it. So like I said, there are good things and bad things about ion sputtering. Here's another example of uh, scanium nitride, UPS, that's being sputtered. If you look closely at the Fermi level, we'll notice that the Fermi level, the density of states diminishes towards the Fermi level on the as positive surface. But with the argon sputtered, argon ion sputtered surface, we are actually inducing a little Fermi level. So this is evidence that we're uh, 
once we're removing the nitrogen from the scanium nitride, we're actually reducing the metal down to reducing scanium from plus three down to metallic. So we're changing the electronic structure of the material. Okay, so I'll briefly summarize XPS and UPS. XPS, it's uh, elementally sensitive. UPS is generally not. Elements that we can see with the XPS are lithium and above. Down to a tenth of the atomic percent. Uh, not much materials damage. <clears throat> Semi-quantitative. Chemical state information we can get from most elements. Depth resolution, five nanometers or so. Lateral resolutions, millimeter to four year to a few microns. Sample types, solid and UHV compatible. And UPS, uh, it's pretty non-destructive. Uh, chemical state information, yes, you can get chemical state information from the UPS, but it's complicated and generally requires models. The depth resolutions are on the same scale or a little bit less than uh, XPS. Lateral resolution is several millimeters, though, with the, the source that we have. And again, the samples have to be uh, UHV compatible. Con conducting samples work the best with our systems. Okay, so now let's move into OJ electron spectroscopy. So this is another widely used technique of surface analysis. Okay, it was first discovered in 1923 by uh, Lisa Meitner. Okay, and then it was later independently discovered once again by Pierre Auger. Now Auger, he actually wrote this material up, and so the technique was then named after him. And so this is a some a hint to all you people out out there when you discover something cool and interesting. Write it up, and then your name will be associated with it. She turns out to, it turns out she was known for other things, and so she didn't lose out by uh, not getting the Oshie spectrometer named after her. Okay, so Oshie electron spectroscopy. You saw that we can see Oshie lines with uh, the XPS, but in general, traditionally, Oshie spectroscopy is done with a scanning or a non-scanned electron beam as our primary <coughs> particle. Electrons turn out to be a little bit easier to make than x-rays because in order to make an x-ray, you have to be able to make an electron first. And so that's why OJ developed initially with an electron beam. <coughs> this is a schematic of the experiment. We'll come in with a finely focused electron probe. And those electrons can interact with quite a large volume that depends upon the kinetic energy of your primary beam. Okay, so... Uh, Throughout that volume, we can have interactions that will produce OJ electrons and X-ray photons. The X-ray photons having a long mean free path will, able, will be able to escape. But the electrons, as you see, saw earlier in the talk, uh, can only escape from a shallow distance. And so we're act, it actually going to only look at the electrons that are emitted from here. So with OJ electron, our analysis area is very close to the probe diameter. Here, this is just a refresh your memory on the OJ process. An instant electron beam will come and eject an OJ electron. And then uh, an upper electron will fill that hole, and then the OJ electron is ejected. And then once again, uh, the kinetic energy of this electron depends upon the amount of energy that was conserved in this relaxation. And the complementary process is the X-ray photon. So this is the uh, process behind uh, the technique known as EDS, which we'll hear about with Vatsik tomorrow. So we don't have a, an X-ray detector on our OJ. Otherwise, we could do EDS and OJ on the same system. Because the... Uh, OJ emission process and the X-ray photon process uh, processes are reciprocal. You'll see that for OJ, the emission probability for light elements is much, much higher than for X-ray photons. And so OJ is good for light elements, and then OJ is, or uh, OJ is good for light elements, X-ray photon, or EDS is good for the heavier elements. So it's good to be able to have both instruments in the same facility. This is the schematic of the instrument. And as you'll notice, 
uh, for those of you that took our tour. An OSHA spectrometer looks a lot like an SEM, which basically it is. It's an SEM that happens to have an OJ energy analyzer that surrounds the electron gun. And by designing the instrument this way, we're able to do SCM imaging and OJ mapping, uh, both in the same line of sight, and so we'll not have any shadowing, which is advantageous in, in studying materials that have a lot of features and structures. Generally, in OJ, we'll look at the electrons energies as they escape from the sample. We don't do any retardation as we do in the uh, XPS. And then our resolutions are then governed by the dimension of the slit. XPS, as you remember, resolutions in constant pass energy mode is constant. OJ energy resolutions are E over delta E. So they vary with kinetic energy. Okay. This is just to show you once again that uh, separations of the orbitals do change, allowing us to get characteristic signal from all the elements just from an OJ line. Okay, these are what the uh, elemental shifts look like. You'll see that they follow the same form as the uh, photoelectron lines, it's the same function. But you'll notice something different once you get up to heavier elements. You'll discover that you're starting to, instead of just producing a few OJ lines, starting to produce a, a lot of OJ lines that actually span a wide spectrum of kinetic energies. So you can see right here, right away, that if you start looking at a lot of compounds with heavy elements, there's going to be a large possibility of overlaps. Okay, here's an example of our uh, first row transition metal nitrides presented in an N of E and in a DN of E mode. So you can collect data and present it either way. Traditionally, people look, look at the data in the first derivative mode. What that does is it removes a fairly intense and linear background from your data and then accentuates your actual peaks. OK, so once again, we can use the signal that we get from the uh, spectrometer and use that to uh, relate to a number of atoms we have per unit volume or our concentration. In this case, the form of this equation is very similar to that of XPS. It, it's just that we're adding two different terms. We're adding the OJ transition probability because now instead of just a simple photoelectron emission, we have photon in, electron out, you also have to have a factor that relates to the, the probability of having one of the upper shell electrons fit into that core hole and then having that energy couple with a valence level electron to be ejected. And then there's also uh, a, a parameter known as the secondary ion coefficient, secondary ionization coefficient. As you can see, the electrons don't travel very far through the solid before they interact. And those OJ electrons can actually excite other OJ electrons. And so usually you'll get, for heavy elements, you'll get a, uh, an enhancement of OJ signal just because those OJ electrons are exciting more OJ electrons. Okay, so once again, we're going to assume our concentration is a uh, relative ratio of the atoms. In doing so, we'll neglect a lot of the instrumental terms. And usually, uh, like XPS, we'll neglect the inelastic mean free path. Usually, we'll neglect uh, the secondary emission coefficient as well because those are also, you can model them if you have pure materials, but if you have an unknown compound, it's going to be a little bit difficult to accurately determine your backscatter coefficient. So generally, they're neglected. And then uh, make the same assumptions that we have a homogeneous mixture that doesn't really apply, uh, assuming um, our analysis volumes are all the same, which doesn't apply either. Uh, for those reasons, OJ is also considered semi-quantitative, but with standards and certain practices, you can make it more quantitative. Okay, this, this shows uh, a relationship with atomic number of the sensitivities of certain transitions. One thing you should note here that um, this scale is now a log scale. My other scale that showed the sensitivities of the XPS lines were linear. This is log. So you can see that you get a very, very significant drop off from the optimum once you go past that. 
And that's because OJ, it's a uh, multi-step process. You have to have all three things to work out right. You have to get the core level electron out, and then you have to have the upper electrons fit just the right way to get the transition to take place. So usually we'll get good sensitivity for certain elements in OJ. Sometimes we'll get really bad things for other ones just by the way the orbitals work out. Sometimes we can enhance our sensitivities a little bit more by running at higher primary energies. Okay, so there's difficulties in determining the peak areas which we'll need for the quantitation with OJ. So what are the two ways we could do it are by using the N of E and doing a peak-to-peak uh, -peak or doing the peak-to-peak -peak in the uh, first derivative mode. So generally, in OJ, we won't do a peak area like we do XPS. Okay, here's an example of our quantitative analysis with the first row transition of metal nitrides. One thing uh, that there's a difficulty that arises with uh, metal nitrides is that the transition metal lines for some of the compounds overlap with the nitrogen. So that means some of the numbers that we get won't be directly related to the metal of nitrogen, nitrogen ratio. It's actually the metal plus nitrogen over the metal. But that's not such a big deal as long as you have another technique you can quantify with RBS, which we have. Uh, we can still use these numbers to do relative changes. We can understand changes in the material. And we can see then, just like the XPS, once we sputter, we're depleting nitrogen from the surface. So we can actually see a little bit of change in the composition following on bombardment. So even though we have overlap with the uh, elements, we could still extract quantitative information from that. Okay, here's an example of the combination of uh, ion sputtering with spectroscopy. And we'll call this technique a depth profile. And here's a uh, group grew an aluminum, palladium, gallium nitride structure on the right. And it should have a theoretical profile shown on the right, right there. Okay, so the as received. So they wanted to study this material uh, before and after annealing. And you'll see during the annealing process, uh, a lot of the palladium diffused into the aluminum. And so this group, I believe, was trying to make either probably ohmic contacts on the gallium nitride and then uh, palladium diffusing in uh, would actually interfere with the electronic structure of the contact and might alter its properties. It turns out that I think this contact probably did not work because it had a lot of um, oxygen in it just from the uh, deposition process. But that's another thing that you actually determine by doing depth profiling. You can look at all the elements present in your uh, sample and determine uh, if you had a failure, what failed. Here's another example of a uh, semiconductor processing trying to, de to determine the uh, success of an etching process. And so this group is trying to uh, make little indium pad or gold pads and then uh, look for indium that was left behind from the etching step. So a, one of the pads was imaged and then jumping in from uh, SEM mode to OJ mapping mode, they're able to see just some indium deposited around the pad, suggesting that the etch worked pretty well in the flats, but there's still a little bit residue around the edges. So that would uh, indicate uh, failure of the process and the need to modify their uh, procedure. Okay, here's an example of now another combination of uh, spectroscopy and imaging of a nickel chromium carbon alloy. You can see, we can see with the SEM, clear domains of different compositions the darker ones have a little bit more chromium and carbon. The lighter regimes are uh, a lot more nickel rich. Okay, so this is a pretty simple example of uh, domains forming in an alloy. So we're going to use this to uh, look at some other methods we can help us identify different phases present in the material. So here in this plot right here, it's a two-dimensional scatter plot, which we're plotting the intensity of the carbon pixels 
as a function, or the intensity of the chromium pixels as a function of the intensity of the carbon pixels. Okay, so we can see where we'll have certain signals uh, correlating with one another. That would identify different phases. So we have a clear phase right here, which is a uh, it makes use makes up about seventy percent. So it's a chromium carbon phase. Then we have another phase that is uh, less chromium rich, but still about the same amount of carbon. Then I just have this is just another example of the same thing with nickel and chromium, nickel and carbon. I mean, sorry. Here's an example of uh, spectroscopy imaging and depth profiling. So one of the nice things about the OJ is because it has a finely focused electron beam, you can probe very small areas. And so with this work, the group is interested in studying the interface between the fiber and the composite material. Because a lot of the properties of your composite, fiber composite material, will be caused by uh, the interface between your matrix and your fiber. That, that is the chemistry. So with the OJ, you can focus in on a little area right here. Sputter it, actually collect the depth profile and understand the elemental dis distribution as a function of depth. Okay, so just uh, briefly summarizing uh, the OJ. OJ will be sensitive to lithium and above. So as you can see, initially, uh, OJ is a three-step process. So you have to start with an element that has at least three electrons. So that's why we need lithium. Uh, it has a similar sensitivity to XBS, but it tends to go to how much percent. Uh, not the same as the examiner, but for some materials such as uh, metal oxide, we can uh, basically, uh, by electron stimulation, go ahead and dissolve the oxygen from the material just by exposure to electrons. Or dissolve other electromagnetic materials. Uh, XS or OJ spectral electrical analysis, semi quantitative without standards, but standards can make it more quantitative. Chemical state information, yes, for some elements, but uh, as far as the high resolution analyzing that we have, and because it's a multi step process, the line shapes can be quite complicated. Line resolutions are sub micron or several nanometers, depending on the type of uh, Thank you very much, Rick. And uh, the paper is open now for discussion. So we have five minutes. So many questions are possible here. Please. <laughs> it's after lunch. Yeah, there is one here. system that we have, we can go um, to a few hundred nanometers because we just focus the electron probe down. The, the lateral resolution of the X-ray that we have in the imaging mode, it's about 